Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Chances are you think that I'm in love with you. Welcome to the show, and thanks for tuning in. I want to say a quick thank you to my guest on last week's episode, world-renowned pickup designer Seymour Duncan. If you didn't get to hear it, you can listen to all of our episodes at entertalkradio.com slash making it, or download our app and take us with you. Be sure to tune in for upcoming episodes with bassist composer Nathan East and music manager, author, and creator organizer of We Are The World, Ken Cragen. We also have a unique one-year anniversary show scheduled that I'm very excited about with special guest host, Melissa Manchester, who will be interviewing me Mm -hmm. as her guest artist. I'd like to take a moment to thank the companies that helped me sound my best in the studio and on stage. Blue Microphones, Seymour Duncan Pickups, Taylor Guitars, Mesa Boogie Amps, D'Addario Strings and Planet Waves, Motu Digital Performer, IK Multimedia, and Exotic Effects. So often, I get asked questions about the creative process, so I created this show to focus on what it takes to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business. You're really in for a treat, as I've invited my friends, some of the best and brightest in music, to share their stories on how they have influenced the music that has shaped our lives. I guarantee you're going to love it. So, let's get started. My guest this week is singer-songwriter Melissa Manchester. Hello, my friend. Hi, Melissa. (laughs) Let me tell you a little bit about Melissa. More than 25 years after Melissa Manchester released Tribute, her 1989 album that honored the great female singers who influenced her, she turned the tables with The Fellas, a radiant homage to Frank Sinatra, Mel Torme, Tony Bennett, Dean Martin, and others, and the iconic songs that they made famous. Many of these tunes embedded themselves into Manchester's musical DNA while she was growing growing up in New York City's Upper West Side. Primarily a solo album, Manchester did recruit one very special fella, Barry Manilow, who duets with her on a jubilant for me and my gal. Manilow and Manchester met 40 years ago when they were young jingle singers trying to break into show business. In fact, Manilow was responsible for introducing her to Bette Midler, which led to Manchester's stint as a founding member of the infamous Harlettes. Following her time as a Harlette, Manchester's tremendously successful solo career brought her critical and commercial acclaim. The Midnight Blues singer received her first Grammy nomination for Best Pop Female Vocal Performance in 1979 for the Peter Allen, Carol Bayer Sager pen, Don't Cry Out Loud winning the Grammy in that category four years later for You Should Hear How She Talks About You. Manchester has also had her songs recorded by Barbara Streisand, Roberta Flack, Dusty Springfield, Alison Krauss, Kenny Loggins, and many others. Two songs she performed, Through the Eyes of Love and The Promise, were nominated for Oscars in the same year. With The Fellas, Manchester completes a journey that began more than a quarter century ago, while also creating an exciting new chapter for her and her fans. Please welcome my guest today, Melissa Manchester. Happy to be here. And I'm happy to be here with you, mm-hmm. always and Thank anywhere. You. Thank you. And today, we're in your home. Yes, you are. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. I, it's, you know, this, this home to me, your home to me, is many things. It's, it's a place of family and friendship and celebration. Mm-hmm. Um, we work here sometimes. We, we collaborate, and, sure. and and the the gems, the beginnings of our ideas, uh, are born right behind you. Right actually. behind me at this piano. Yes, yes. What we just heard, a piece of chances are. Yes. Uh, which is from the fellas. Yes. And thank you for that lovely introduction. You're welcome. You gorgeously arranged. 
uh, for the Blue Note Orchestra at yeah. Citrus College. And um, it was my tribute to Johnny Mathis. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a song that I thought of prior to Chances Are, but I couldn't find a way to open it up. And you arranged the only song on the fellas that is completely rethought mm -hmm. and re redressed. Reimagined. Reimagined yeah. entirely. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, I remember us sitting right there. And um, I, I, the thing about Chances Are is that there was this, um, what I call an, uh, an intentional comma, an emotional comma, uh, after each uh, each time the phrase chances are is set up with a new idea that follows and um, and it it had this luscious space to fill as a bossa nova or a samba or whatever mm -hmm. but uh, you did such a glorious glorious job thank you mm -hmm. it was fun because we really um well, it was, it was more than fun. It was incredibly moving mm -hmm. to be a part of, um, of your new album and to, to be the renegade with you, to, to yeah. go off the beaten path with right. the song and to take chances. Well, you certainly did yeah. because when we were in the studio and that opening section with just the strings happened and it was, it, it had no, I, I didn't know where we were going and I thought, uh-oh. Oh, no, we're good. Right. <laughs> it was beautiful. Well, that, that was part of, I wanted to build a world. You did. That, that Absolutely did. didn't exactly tell you where you were going except into beauty. Right. In some way. Right. It unfolded. It was gorgeous. Yeah. And, and it continued to unfold through, mm -hmm. the, through the arrangement and your performance. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really um, a great experience to, to work with the, the, with the students. Yes. You know, let, let's talk about the Blue Note Orchestra and Citrus College for, for a moment. Sure. Uh, I'm an uh, artist in residence there and have been. I was invited to be artist in residence by the former head of um, the Performing Arts Department, Ben Bollinger. And in the beginning, you know, I did a concert and used some of their citrus singers. And their citrus singers are spectacular. Just in the month of December, they do over 50 concerts. Right all around the country, overseas, they're spectacular. They are. Um, but more recently, um, I recorded my 20th album, You Gotta Love the Life, which you co-produced with me. And one of the reasons is because prior to that, you were kind enough to explain to me what this new world of an independent artist right. and what crowdfunding meant. Mm -hmm. And that it was part of this new paradigm for the marketplace and um, and so so i sallied forth yeah <laughs> <laughs> into the world bravely you, you did bravely, very courageously in spite of a <laughs> trembling hand and foot understandably yeah and and we were invited to use the incredible studio at citrus college mm -hmm. um and we did and it was my return to to making an album with my band and, and fantastic musicians who mm -hmm. were your colleagues and my colleagues. And in that experience, uh, because of your connections and mine, uh, suddenly Al Jarreau was coming in right. and Dion Warwick. And, uh, you know, I was meeting with Joe Sample and, right. and you Stevie, know, Wonder Stevie Wonder and Dave Koz. Right, yeah. and Dave Koz. And because, because the studio at Citrus College though it is state of the art, it is also a teaching facility. Right. And our engineer, Tim Jaquette, is professor of audio mm -hmm. arts. Uh, during our time together there, a, a small group of engineering students would come in mm -hmm. and sit quietly Very and watch. Very respectfully. Reverentially, is yes, what I think. Yes, better choice of a word. Seeing, <laughs> yes. seeing how musical discussions would happen between you and the musicians, and myself and me and the artists. and. And the many of the engineering students, I would guess, had never seen that because the convention these days is you make an album in your garage and the only person you actually talk to is the pizza delivery guy <laughs> at four in the afternoon. Right. So there they were. And even while they were watching all these discussions, Tim Jaquette, the professor, mm -hmm. who would look up at the screen above the control board, would ask the students while we're recording or setting up, why am I turning this dial? What is the effect I'm hoping right. to gain? And they would have to answer him very quietly. And I thought, oh 
my, there are so many layers of experience right. happening here. And it was just, I mean, it was, it was thrilling. Yes. And so after I too. came, right, yeah. it was fantastic. So after I came back from performing with the Citrus mm -hmm. uh, Blue Note Orchestra in Hawaii, uh, Dean Bob Slack, uh, now head of uh, the um, Performing Arts Department, had asked me if there was an idea I could think of to incorporate the Blue Note Orchestra into a project of mm -hmm. mine. And I said, funny you should ask. And I explained to him about this this completion of an idea that started with the tribute album that I'd always wanted to complete with the fellas. So you knew immediately when he asked the question that this was this well, was the album. Well, it had been lurking sort of over here. Right. So when when that opening came up, it was a done deal in right. forty minutes. Sure. And yeah. um, and we ended up recording eight tracks yeah. in one day. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'd never recorded eight tracks in one day. And the album was effectively done in two weeks. Right. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and it, eight tracks in one day with an orchestra. W yes. Not just the, eight tracks in one day. Right, right. Yeah. Well, we had the big band and yeah. the rhythm section the first day and percussion the first day. Right. We had French horns and harp the second day. Mm -hmm. And we had the string section the third day done. Right, right. <laughs> Done, was, done, done, right. It was fantastic. <laughs> right. And the arrangement. It was, it was like uh, air traffic control. It with, was. With Bob just saying, it, okay, you're next. next. But <laughs> right. And what was thrilling is, because I did crowdfunding again yeah. this time, yeah. for those who had contributed enough, some of the fans were sitting in the control room the first day, and I mean, their heads were just exploding. Yes. They had never been through anything like this. Before. And this, this um, independent artist mm -hmm. world that you have marched so bravely into <laughs> that I've invited Thank you, you coach. into. You're, it's great, great to have you on the team. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that we really talked about and discovered about crowdfunding is is it's not just about an exchange of money right. it's an energetic exchange it's it's an it's an invitation to our fans and friends to really become a part of the creative process that's the thing i had no idea that my fans would be so interested in the process right. i mean for me that's the filet of music yeah, yeah, you know yeah, yeah. putting it together but but this this village that was created mm -hmm. where these sweet aunties and uncles <laughs> had the opportunity to lean in yeah. and i remember uh, on our project yeah. the the release had to be delayed a little bit right. you know yeah. and and you know, I, I wasn't sure what the reaction would be, and everyone would say, "Don't worry, just get it right. right. We're here for you whenever it's right." right. And I thought, "Wow, this is your fan base." Oh, it's just—it was so dear. Yeah. It was really precious. And when we recorded, uh, "You Got to Love the Life," right, um, the first album that we did together. Yes. I was a little concerned mm -hmm. about being distracted mm -hmm. um, a little bit by students and, and a little bit by the fans mm -hmm. that had you know become part of this process mm -hmm. and some invited to the sessions. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't even get up to pee. <laughs> they were so quiet. So true. <laughs> they, were, they were so re reverent and, and in awe yeah. of the... They just didn't want to miss anything. The, right, the creative... They did not want to miss right. anything. Yeah. And that's how I feel when I'm in a yeah. studio. It's, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just mesmerized by our creative process and by our I mean yours and mine individually us collectively and our tribe well you know? I, yes indeed I speaking of that I love the fact that you know you were there that first day Doug Walter our ranger was there Peter Hume yeah. was there young David Catalan was there who was an alum of yeah. Citrus nobody would leave everybody wanted to listen to everybody else's arrangement it was so yeah it was so glorious yes I mean it was so glorious yeah. it was beautiful yeah I, f I felt like part of a, an arranging family you know and uh, we did we we were also excited to to hear what everybody wrote because and you know what happens yes. is that the kids get it this is not their genre of music swing hard swing right, right. is not their genre of music but they are trained so magnificently by Bob Slack, you know, when we're not around. Yes. He is their guy. Right. And he he doesn't just teach them about music, he teaches them about life in real time. There you go. And and yeah. the high level of expectation that they reach. And if they have the problem, he zeroes in on them and and explains to them why what they are doing is important, why they are 
part of a larger world that yeah. simply didn't exist before they were yeah. part of it. It's it's really fantastic because a lot of these kids are first generation college kids. Right. And um, you know uh, when Barry Manilow, you were talking mm -hmm. referring to him before. You know, when he came in to Citrus to to hear the final version, the orchestrated version of For Me and My Gal, it blew his mind. I mean... Well, Barry's he, passion is music education and it, it music. It saved his life. Music education saved his life. Yes. And so when he came there and he heard the rehearsing and the chatter and the vocalese by the students in the hallways, mm -hmm. he got so excited. And, and when he asked about what it took to get into this place... Um, he was told it costs about 500 bucks a semester. Yes. And all you need to do is graduate high school to get in there because the, the professors will put you in a group that will most service your ability in that moment. But it's just... Uh, this is... It's the it's American ex dream. It really is. Right? And it's a, it's a beautiful example of uh, um, junior college. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went to a junior college in Miami before I moved to Boston and went to Berkeley wow. and had... Um, not as magnificent of an experience because they didn't have a studio, mm -hmm. but when I got to Berkeley, I tested out of the first two years of, of college wow. based on what I had done in junior college. And, wow. that's, and I knew I worked hard and I had great mm -hmm. teachers, but that's when I realized the quality of education yes. that I got at yes. uh, an inexpensive school. Right. And it's just so important and so fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a privilege to... to be able to be a part of their experience. It is a privilege for me. That is exactly the right word because I remember the beginning of my career. It never leaves you. Right. And for those who are just starting, um, they don't know what happens next. You know, they they right. don't know what kind of stumbling will happen, what kind of triumph will happen, mm -hmm. and to be able to to say. Whatever it is, this is a hell of a memory you've just created for yourself. <laughs> right. Keep going. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. We had the same experience with Stevie Wonder when he walked into the school. Well, <laughs> that one was for the books. On I your mean, previous album. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Stevie Wonder came in to sing on a song that I had uh, written with Tom Snow. Mm -hmm. And he, he came in to play harmonica. Yes. And he brought in his box of harmonicas and couldn't have been more generous uh, with yeah. his playing, he kept saying, "Let me, let me try this, or let me do. Did I do good?" You know, mm -hmm. all that. And uh, and when it was over, he he heard the kids, the small group of kids that were left on the campus because it was spring break, rehearsing in uh, one of the rehearsal rooms, and he charged down. Right, he was the, he hallway. Just down the hallway. A bunch of us were running <laughs> after the blind man who was running towards the rehearsal room, and he stopped at the threshold of the rehearsal room, and they were the kids were rehearsing, and and one of the girl singers stopped, and she she said she asked him, "Would you like to sing with us?" And he said, "What do you got?" And they said, we've been rehearsing Superstition. <laughs> and he went right to the center of the band, surrounded by the horn players who were on bleacher uh, seats and, and the rhythm section that was behind him. And he sang. Yeah. And they played. Yes. And it was just thrilling. And all the grown-ups in the room were weeping It was an delight. incredible moment I will never forget. Uh, we're heading into our first commercial Great. break. Uh, I'm here with Melissa Manchester in her home. And we will be right back, so stick around for more stories. I've got a lot of questions to ask you about. The Fellas, the new record. Great. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio, to sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. 
Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? And you're listening to Making It with Terry Woolman. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome back. I'm here in the beautiful home mm-hmm. of Melissa Manchester. And we are talking about this brand new record that is coming out on the 8th of uh, September. September. Mm-hmm. And it's called The Fellas. And you just saw a, a video of uh, the new single. That's what yes. we were just sharing. Ain't that a kick in the head? Which just hit the Billboard charts number one most added, I believe. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you so much, sweetie. Thank you. Yeah. And the video showed the Citrus Blue Note Orchestra. That's them playing with me. Yes. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's, you know, there's, there's something so magical about um, setting the bar so high and then showing them the, the ferocity and, and passion that is required. Well, you know, I have eased into being the village elder. <laughs> You know, I've had a, uh, you know, I'm I'm zeroing in. I'm up to about 47 years now doing this. And um, for a long time, I was the youngest one in the band Mm -hmm. and the youngest one here. And and, um, now that I'm well seasoned and well into my career and my life, Mm -hmm. um, to to be able to share this back and forth with young ones, or if I'm teaching in a one-on-one or with a, a... crowd like the Blue Note Orchestra. It's really, it's lovely. Yeah. It's lovely. I always had a feeling, my parents were educators. They were not musicians Mm -hmm. or artists, but I always had a feeling that teaching would be somewhere in my DNA that, and that really the most appropriate time to to teach would be as I got older, Mm -hmm. when I had a point of view and something to say. Did you, at a younger age, think that at some point you would want to be mentoring and sharing? I never thought about it. Because you were just touring and writing? And yes, I was very busy. And, and raising was, a family? And I was, yes, I did all of those. I raised my two kids, I toured, I wrote, I wrote for Disney projects, yeah. I wrote for musical theater. theater. Yes. Um, and then I got a call from USC asking if I would take over a class that had been taught by uh, the theater composer Jason Robert Brown mm-hmm. to teach a very interesting class called um, theater, musical theater writing for pop students. And I thought, okay, I'll be right over. Yeah. I never, they said, would you, can you do this? I said, Starring Melissa Manchester. Yes, I can. <laughs> right. And we, we, you know, at the end of the 15 Tuesday evening classes, yeah. we created a musical. And it was, it was unbelievable to not only create that, yeah. but it was unbelievable to have a sense of, I know how to do this. Right. I, I wasn't trained for this. I just had the life experience mm-hmm. 
primarily because of the childhood that I had, right. you know, um, having a father who was a bassoonist in the opera, so I grew up backstage at the Met Opera a lot. And, and your mother was artistic as she well. She was. She was a pioneer in the fashion industry, yes. and she had been a singer. So my sister and I were, were raised in a very artistic um, environment, and so dreaming and going after our dreams was what was expected. Not that it would be easy, never easy, but no. it was simply, you know, if you have a dream, go for it. Well, and as it turns out, your, your mom and dad were right because both you and your sister Claudia are extremely accomplished <laughs> at the paths that you've taken. Right, right. Yes, she is a producer for E! Entertainment News. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, yes, yeah, so it was, uh, it was fascinating. And to be able to share my experience from being a performer with young performers because, as I said, I've been doing this over 45 years now, and they can't imagine what 45 days from now will be. <laughs> right. And right. so I, besides talking to them about song structure or harmony or perfect rhyme schemes or whatever, I talk to them about strategies, life strategies, um, because because your your body and your your path become your lab, become your laboratory. Right. And you have to figure out what nutritionally, what sleep wise, what spiritual wise will keep you strong and centered so you can keep doing this. And I also explained to them that one of the one of the things that irks me so terribly is when a performer comes on stage and says I'm so bored having to sing this song that made me famous 40 oh, years so ago, but, but you paid for it, so here I am singing, and right. I'm thinking, really? <laughs> you know, right. These are such incredible blessings, and what right. I have found in terms of performing is that the songs that people want to hear, I have grown with, and the experience of singing them, whether I've written them or not, has deepened. Yes. Because I understand the inner life of the song more right. now, and that's fantastic to share. I, I see that in your performing, both um, when I get to share the stage with you mm -hmm. playing guitar, but also when I'm in the audience listening to you mm -hmm. sing. And remembering also this really beautiful experience we had recording mm -hmm. um, Home to Myself, a oh, song yes. from your very first record mm -hmm. uh, on my Christmas album. Mm -hmm. But the thing that, that was so um, intriguing about the idea was having you get to revisit a story that you wrote when you were 24, 24 with Carol mm -hmm. Bayer Sager mm -hmm. to come back fully formed or as a yes. grown ass woman or yes. you know somebody who has experienced a lot of life since yes. those very wise and prophetic words were written mm -hmm. as, as young women and, mm -hmm. and to um, bring another level of depth yeah. to the story. It's mystical, really. Yes, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's mystical. Yeah. I, think. Mm -hmm. I, I find nothing boring about that. Right, and how many, how many ways can you <clears throat> live, make a living through living your life? Right. I mean, it's, um, you know, art is, is just one of those things where you, where you draw from your life or the world around you in that time frame and write about it or write about your impressions of it. It's, uh, and when it resonates with people or when it helps to clarify things for people, you know, it, it's sort of the gift that keeps on giving because for me, it starts with a blank piece of paper mm -hmm. and a pen and, and an idea mm -hmm. that I, you know, I don't know if the idea is the title or tucked in the middle of the second verse. I, you know, you just don't know until you keep, it, it's like peeling an onion from the inside out. Yes. You know? So it's, it's really something. So let's talk about this new stage of your life where you have also added um, as songwriter, performer, pianist, singer, teacher. Mm -hmm. Now you're a record producer. I am. The, the, you're basically two records in. I am. Of, I'm so very proud of you in, in co-producing your own music and bringing your own vision um, and taking responsibility for what it is that you want and, and being really fearless about it, I think. You know, I, you've been um, open-hearted and open-minded, but, but still with a very strong point of view. And I'm wondering, how are you feeling going from you got to love the life to the fellas? Are you enjoying producing? Well, part of it is entirely your fault. <laughs> And that's because for, for when we were co-producing, you kept saying, okay, what is it you're looking for? You know, you kept checking in with me. 
And I think because, um, I, I think what happens is that I started to get more and more a sense of being able to trust my instincts. You know, in the right. early days, everything was so compartmentalized. You were the girl singer, and this would your, be your producer. Right. And sometimes it really worked out beautifully, and sometimes you thought, okay, I'm so lost here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm losing my, my sense of, forget about well-being, I'm yeah. just losing my sense of place. Right. And, um, and I stepped away from the recording industry for a while because I was raising my kids, but I just needed a new perspective because the industry was changing so. But... But now that I'm fully ensconced sitting in that steering mm -hmm. seat, behind that steering wheel, I know what I know. Right. You know, what are they going to say? You didn't have 45 years behind you? Yeah. I did. Right. You know, and I've had some fantastic success and some blazing failure right. and real stumbling in between because we're always stumbling. And by the way, we're always auditioning. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, to... To just stay quiet with, I know what I know. Right. You know, somebody in the room may have a better idea, and I'm always open for a better idea. Please, mm -hmm. right. show up smarter than I am, please. Right. <laughs> but, but, but at the base level, you know, in making the fellas, I know this music. This is the music of my childhood. Right. I don't, you know, I don't have to figure out how to sing this. Right. I know how to sing this, and so that's why every take was two or three takes, and that was it. Right, it's we in your done. DNA that you grew up listening yeah. to this music. Yeah, as opposed to a new song where you think, okay, what am I trying to capture here? Right. What's the strength of the song? What's the real inner life? Mm -hmm. I mean, with these songs that the, most of the world knows, it's just about, well, where in relationship to me do, do I want to refine it so that my take on it is is very clear and that it yes pays homage to the great artist mm -hmm. but it is also um, in this moment it is in this moment and um, not not a not a literal copy of a former arrangement mm -hmm. so. you know I'm so glad to hear you you answer the question the way that you did because that I saw a fire in you that I wanted to stir you know, stir up the ashes mm -hmm. and blow into it yeah. and create a flame of, of you expressing your point of view and having right. the freedom, mm -hmm. which you were denied, like, like many yes, artists, um, to, to express. Yes. And because when we were collaborating together as producers, I didn't want to make my album. I wanted to make your album. Right. And I needed to know what that was right. so I could help guide you to finding that. Right and showing you my process right. in doing that. And uh, some of that is deliberately stumbling into some magic, you know, making yeah. room for some magic and, and um, you know, and surrounding yourself with the right people, yes. you know, casting and, yeah. and sh shared passion and point of view. Mm -hmm. and, and then again, and like you said, being open to somebody smarter walking into the room to have exactly right. possibly an even better idea. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You, you just mentioned about we are always auditioning. Could you elaborate on that? Well, every time you get up to bat with a new project, you know, you hope everybody in the entire world <laughs> will love it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and sometimes you make, you create an artistic achievement, but it's not a commercial success. Mm -hmm. And if it's not a commercial success, um, I don't know about you, but I, 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 you know, I start to doubt myself and I sometimes take to bed for a day or two and just get very still mm -hmm. because when you're in the moment of creating, you feel that you're on the right path. And if you feel it so deeply, you must feel, okay, this is, this, this must be being supported by the universe because somehow I'm feeling guided. Right. But sometimes you just get a, a quiet echo back, mm -hmm. you know, you and so, and so you don't know if you're going to get another shot, right? Uh, because many things go along with with um, creating the album. You know, you have to tour in order to support it. You have to do press in order to support that. And because we're in a society that um, that doesn't take note of veteran artists as much as it really is attracted to the new kid on the block. Mm -hmm. 
the embryo. Yeah, you, you have to see how, you know, the, I guess the trickiest thing is to see how you can be relevant. Mm -hmm. The other side of that is, because I've been doing this so long, I don't know that relevance is that terribly important. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's another, there's another sh shading, uh, there's another nuancing to being relevant because, you know, when you're in your 20s and 30s, they want you to be current. Right. And, and you know, I've heard that many decades of my career, and that was never my interest. My interest was always to be timeless. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of those mm. execs at the record companies, they, they barely can spell timeless. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it means. Right. And so I guess I was a handful sometimes to some of, of the record company presidents because I was, you know, I, I more and more consciously bring forth the great artists that meant everything to me as a kid mm -hmm. because they shined the light on me. Right. Uh, that's why I did the tribute album. Um, and so and for the women that I paid homage for, they were rarely surrounded by people that helped them stay healthy and sane yeah. and financially safe. Very true. Um, and for the men, I just don't want them to be forgotten mm -hmm. uh, because I just think this music is so um, is such of a platinum standard because it's not just the singers. It's the songwriters that wrote for the singers. Mm -hmm. These were not singer-songwriters. Mm -hmm. These were stellar performers who had stellar writers writing for them. And so it's this, um, it's this chapter uh, uh, in the American Songbook that I don't think is sentimental at all. And I don't approach this with any kind of sentimentality. Mm -hmm. This was simply music that had vibrancy and excellence and vitality mm -hmm. to it that I think should be brought forth. And swing is so authentically American. Mm -hmm. It's as American as jazz is, in my opinion. Right. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's so, it's so uh, joyful in a time where we need joy mm -hmm. uh, in this world and in this country. And so to be part of that is, is lovely and meaningful for yeah. me. Uh, well, I agree, we need joy. Mm -hmm. and, and one way to uh, create joy is to um, make art mm -hmm. to, and to share art. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, if it creates some happiness for you, then mm -hmm. it, that's where it starts. Right. You know, if your experience is one of joy, then it's, the, it's throwing a, a pebble out on a pond. There's a ripple effect of, right. of joy to people that hear it. Right. I mean, I've, I've been privileged in my career as a writer to have people in the day mm -hmm. send me fan letters about how songs have helped them decide not to commit suicide or mm. help them while they were over in Vietnam or right. help them decide to make a baby to right. my music or help them you know, or to walk them you know serenade them down the the bridal aisle mm -hmm. but sometimes you just uh, you just want to sing songs that are are that just make you happy mm -hmm. you know and they also they also are reflective of a of a much more optimistic time i agree yeah yeah well they make me happy hearing mm -hmm. them i think this album is really going to um have a long life oh, this is you. a timeless Thanks. one as well we're heading into our commercial break right now um, when we come back I want to talk a little bit more um, about some of your early experiences like your Harlet experiences sure. and also talk about some of the the, the other songs on the record Great. so uh, I'm here with Melissa Manchester in House of Manchester <laughs> surrounded by great art and um, and energy and memories and we will be right back so please stick around Hey everybody, this is Phil Perry. Stay tuned for another portion of Making It. 
Okay, Hi, well. this is Tim Dolbear, host of Sound Experience here on InterTalk Radio. And Source Connect by Source Element is the essential tool that we use to link between my studio in Austin, Texas, and the WS radio station in San Diego. Now, with Source Connect, not only can we communicate in real time and with HD audio, but it's synced up and is of a high enough quality that I can use it for real time ADR work, remote recording, and overdubbing, and it even allows me to remotely control a DAW. Source Connect by Source Element, affordable, high quality audio and video connection over the internet for all of your production needs. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on InterTalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. Hi, this is Matt LaPointe from O2. You're listening to Making It with Terry Warren. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Venus to my love, no that for her choice. Strictly between us, you're cuter than Venus. What's more, you got on so. Let's call in corner, any cozy little corner. Love is just around the corner. Welcome back. I'm here with Melissa Manchester. I'm loving talking with you. I always As do. Always, it's yes. it's um, so easy. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this song that, that, that we just heard. Well, love is just around the corner. It's just it's a simple little ditty, as they say. Yeah. But uh, I was while well, I was doing research. For, to find the, the appropriate song to represent each one of these fellas. I, uh, I checked in on YouTube one night at around 2 in the morning. I had my phone. I was here. I was looking at Mel Torme references, and I saw him performing this scat tour de force. Yeah. Uh, George Shearing was playing piano, and I thought, okay, what? <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> and I thought, that's that's what I have to do, because on, on tribute, mm -hmm. I paid... Uh, tribute to Ella Fitzgerald to Ella, yes. with her Lady Be Good scat. And, uh, and Mel's was so ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and it had never been orchestrated before. And I thought, oh, yum. And again, young David Catlin, who is this, it, besides being an alum of Citrus College, mm -hmm. he is a horn player. Yeah. And so he understands that world so fiercely. Right. And he wrote this ridiculous arrangement of "Love's Just Around the Corner," yeah. and there I am doing the scat with, with the horn section, and uh, and to do it live now is just it's just wild. It so. looks like you're having a ball when you sing a it. A ball yeah. and a half. Yeah. But it's so when I was recording, it was so exhausting. Yeah. It was really exhausting because you, you I had to learn this piece uh, phonetically and section by section. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing extremely intentional listening to what Mel is doing. Right. And, um, and I had faith that one day I would be able to do it at the speed with which he did it. Uh -huh. 
But until I did it, I would practice it section by section very slowly just to get my jaw and my tongue and my mouth muscles to just relax so I could get it out. Would you practice at the piano playing chords or I walking around the, the house? Piano. No, no, no. I, no, I, I practiced um, usually driving in the car. Mm -hmm. Uh, he would be singing with me, and I would just learn it sing with piece Mal. by piece. You know, because yeah. if you're driving, you know, it you're not. It frees up a part of yeah, your brain. Yeah, it does. It does exactly. It yeah. frees up a part of your brain. And so, uh, so now I do it, and I wonder what all the problem was. <laughs> but that's the, you know, that's the world of scat. But yeah, it's just um, it's so dear. You know, you know, Mel was one of the artists that was kind enough to record a song of mine, and so to pay him back yeah. and thank him in this way. It's just fabulous. What are those experiences like for you? What have, have they been like when you have Mel Torme or, or, or Barbra Streisand sing yeah. a song that you wrote? Well, uh, it, it's larger than the sum of its parts mm -hmm. because, as I said before, I remember when singers would have great writers write for them. Yes. So to be a singer-songwriter but still to have the experience of having a great so singer like Streisand or Roberta Flack mm -hmm. or Alison Krauss, mm -hmm. you know, sing your song and bring to it, bring to it their interpretation, which it's not just unique, it's very often better. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, I rewrote a song for Streisand mm -hmm. uh, that she ended up singing at her wedding and then recording. And through her questions and prodding the original composition, I rewrote it, except for the chorus with Tom Snow. The song was just one lifetime. She she made it a better song because right. of her, her questions. In her questions, were they direct conversations with you? Did you sit they, and talk they about were, the song? They were some they were some. I got the overall note that the that the chorus of Just One Lifetime was perfectly intact. She just couldn't follow the intention of the the verses, mm -hmm. and so I asked my collaborator Tom Snow if he'd be willing to deconstruct and mm -hmm. reconstruct. I mean, we wrote new melody, new yeah. verse, and uh, and we took into her account her moment in life. She had found the love of her life, and she was about to embark on this lovely marriage, yeah. and what that meant, and how it would, and who she was, and. So, you know, in writing, it's like in writing for theater, you're writing for a character and their world. Mm -hmm. We could write for Miss Streisand and her world in this moment, right. and it was, it was beautiful. Yeah. You, you actually write for theater more than people might know, and you, you, you had a beautiful collaboration with Rupert Holmes. With Rupert Holmes, yes, and Sharon Vaughn. Sharon Rupert Vaughan. wrote the book, and Sharon Vaughn wrote the lyrics for mm -hmm. The Sweet Potato Queens. Mm -hmm which um, was done at uh, Tut's in Houston, poor Houston, mm, uh, a yeah. year ago, March, and it was, it was spectacular, and um, it looks like it's going to have a new life, mm -hmm. and that's lovely. But I had a, a show off-Broadway several years ago called I Sent a Letter to My Love that I wrote with Jeff Sweet, and I've written for Disney. I wrote Lady and the Tramp 2 with Norman Gimbel and uh, The Great Mouse Detective, and so... I, you know, I love writing for characters. Mm -hmm. It's it's beautiful. Songwriting is not that. Mm -hmm. Songwriting, you're mostly writing about yourself, unless you can sort of disengage, and and start seeing that that a character is taking over. And that, at this point, that often does happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Harlets for a minute, sure. just like a little walk down memory lane. Yeah. Um, which was where you and Barry first became friends. Yes. And do you have any favorite memories? I know there were, there was a lot. There were a lot of memories with yes. that. But any fun story, like a worst or a best? Yeah. Well, Barry experience? and I, Barry and I met because we were both jingle singers. Yes. And um, and he introduced me to Bet, and I, I worked, uh, I created the Harlets mm -hmm. with with Barry, and uh, I was the Toots in the middle for about six months, and uh, it was so fantastic to be behind and to the left of Bette mm -hmm. uh, for those six months because it was at the beginning of her ascendancy. Right. And um, the, the thing was is, you know, Bette says I have the, so she, I'm talking about herself, she has the soul of a librarian because <laughs> she's, she's deeply intelligent right. and very scholarly right. and does deep research before she throws herself into a project and she throws herself into the deep end of the project. Right. And, um, and so to see how she transported an audience, and in those days, 
it was her power was that she galvanized uh, the gay audience because they didn't have a voice then. Mm -hmm. This was prior to AIDS. And so when she sang You Gotta Have Friends, mm -hmm. that she learned from her friend Buzzy Linhart, who wrote it, mm -hmm. and he wrote it down for her on a roll of toilet paper that she then brought to Barry and said, and he said, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> uh, but it became her anthem, and it became the anthem for the gay community. Right. It was really uh, yeah. amazing. But to, but to see what she did and how she communicated and created an instant community with the audience, it was, it was amazing. And I, in the early years of my career, I, I saw um, how she, how her attitude certainly influenced me for a while. Mm -hmm. I, I look at early videos and I think, oh my, 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 I need to <laughs> stop that as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And it, eventually, you know, you find your own way. Mm -hmm. But, but um, when I first met Bet, um, Barry had brought her to this club that I was playing at, which was diagonally across the street from her club, and I finished my set, and Barry introduced me to Bet, and she had just done her first Johnny Carson performance, and I, I we were also excited for yeah. her because we were traveling in packs, right. all of us singer songwriters, mm -hmm. and Bet was never a singer songwriter; she was just a performer, mm -hmm. and um, and I asked her what she was going to be doing next after I congratulated her on her Carson performance, and she said, "I'm getting ready to do my first uh, Carnegie Hall performance." And I said, wow, are you going to have background singers? And she said, well, I don't know. Would you like to sing in back of me? And I said, well, actually, I'd like to sing instead of you <laughs> right now. I'd be happy to. And that's how we formed the Harlots. So it was great. Yeah. I, I, I love that story. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's talk about some of the other songs on the record sure. and, and how you chose them. And, and also, is there maybe a second uh, version of this record coming out? Do you, you want to do part two? I, oh, thinking about my it? God. You know, I, I, what Ella Fitzgerald did with the American Songbook, which was album after album yeah. dedicated to one writer, I certainly would love to do an album dedicated to the Silver Screen stars, you know, Fred oh, Astaire yeah. and, and more of Gene Kelly mm -hmm. and all of those guys. But uh, sure, I would love to. Again, you know, this is, this is the music that informed my soul that was a part of my every single day yeah. at dinner time. Yes. Uh, my mother sang this stuff, I sang this stuff, my father would hum it. It was just in the air. And I just, I think there's such a wealth of the great songwriters who wrote great songs for these great singers, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah. Was it a huge challenge to narrow this, this incredible uh, songbook down to eight songs? Uh, it was an interesting challenge. You know, at, at first there were more singers that were on the list. Mm -hmm. And so I had to really sort of whittle down who spoke the deepest to me. Um, there are lots of really well-known singers from those days. Mm -hmm. um, but there was something so specific about these singers. Um, you know, they, they just spoke to me. I mean, Nat Cole singing Smile, written by the greatest clown who ever lived, Charlie Chaplin, mm -hmm. just underscored Nat's elegance and dignity. Mm -hmm. You know, he was so successful in a unforgiving time yeah. uh, f for an African-American successful man. Well, to be given his own television show is extraordinary. Oh, yes, extraordinary. And, and he brought such an elegance right. to everything right. that he did. And to my recollection, he never spoke of any of the hardships in his life. He mm -hmm. never spoke of the burning cross on the front lawn of his Beverly Hills home. Right. Never. Right. And and I don't speak of that when you know when I was first releasing the the press for the album. Mm -hmm. But I just thought that his rendition of Smile was um, was really glorious and I wanted to to use that to pay tribute to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an exquisite exquisite arrangement also. Thanks. So I think it's one of the most um, touching performances on the record. Thanks. Is there any song that was the ninth song that, <laughs> <laughs> that didn't quite make it? Wow, the ninth song. Well, the original, the original Johnny Mathis song was Wonderful, Wonderful. Uh -huh. But I just could not figure out how to open it up. It just wouldn't have landed. Um, it would not have landed. I was thinking of Joe Williams. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of yeah. uh, Hey Baby, Ain't I Been Good to You. Yeah. 
because um, I, I knew Joe, and the last time I saw Joe uh, was at a tribute for Ella Fitzgerald at Lincoln Center, and it was an all-star lineup, and I think they gave Ella the key to the city mm. and the key to anything that they could find a key <laughs> right. to, and Joe Williams brought her out on stage, and the audience just went cuckoo bananas. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were just tearing the place apart. And we were all on stage, and, and they wouldn't let her off the stage, and finally, they did let her off the stage, and, and Joe escorted her, and she was walking past me, and she turned her head to me, and she said, did I do good? Oh. Okay, bye. We are coming to the end of our conversation talking about The Fellows, your new record. Mm -hmm. I, being that this is a year of uh, doing shows and you were my first guest, I asked you this question a, a year ago, and, and I'm going to ask you again, but I'm going to remind you what your answer was. Uh -huh. and, and I close every show with this question, okay. which is, at this chapter of your life with mm -hmm. everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? A year ago, you said to me, whenever you feel panic to make a decision, slow down. Mm -hmm. Slow down, because that is the key to wisdom. Because in your slowing down, that's where you'll find your wisdom. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would like to add to that or amend a year later? I, I would have given the same answer. It's in slowing down, which is really hard for young artists to do. They can't really feel what slowing down means. Mm -hmm. um, slowing down is real. Um, it takes real mental discipline. There is such a thing in the brain known as slowing down. Right. And whatever prayer or mantra or motto you have to say it literally as slow as possible in the in the slowness of the recitation of it the space between the words allows your highest self or god or whatever to come through with a better idea or the answer um, to the point where sometimes I just turn my head around and say, okay, thank you, I didn't, I didn't know that that would be my answer, but there it is. Right. Yeah, I think that, that it still holds true. Slowing down is, is the mother load of wisdom. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would agree with that. The new album is The Fellas. The Fellas. Melissa, it's a beautiful picture. Thank you. And um, why don't you set up the, the last song? The last song is the last song on the album, and it's my tribute to Tony Bennett. This was not the first choice of a song that I was going to sing of his, but when I watched him sing it at the end of his 90th birthday celebration at Radio City Music Hall, mm -hmm. I thought, there it is. There is the statement, the question that is posited at the end of his incredibly long career a career which he says has allowed him to see life as a learning experience and I agree with that life mm -hmm. is all about learning mm -hmm. and it is it, it is the metaphor of the question how do you keep the music playing how do you keep life vital how do you keep curiosity alive and uh, and when I when I recorded it those magnificent lyrics by my friends Marilyn and Alan Bergman mm -hmm. it's such a interestingly structured monologue you you almost I found myself almost approaching the first part of the lyric as a thought to myself and the second half of the lyric to the person I'm singing to it was just a fascinating moment in the studio mm -hmm. so with music by Michelle Legrand yeah so I think it's a lovely way to end the fellas so the, that is the the eighth song on it's your record. Song, it's the yes. closing song in your record, mm -hmm. and and today the closing song of our show. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always a pleasure. I, I thank you so much for spending the hour with me, and I'm very excited about everybody hearing this record. I really wanted you all to know about it. So do yourself a favor and go check out the fellas. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. How do you keep the music playing? How do you make it last?
your groove on. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Inner Talk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio, to sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com.